Uh, the Ford Foundation, one of the goals that we have is to help alleviate poverty and to reduce injustice. In developing countries, microfinance for much of the population is critical to them because many of these families work in the informal sector and operate small businesses. And banks uh, do not lend to these families. Banks typically do not let these families open savings accounts. And so access to microfinance services is the only way in which they'll be able to get um, sums of money that are larger than they can save themselves. Right now they're estimating that between two and three million families will lose their homes through foreclosures. The indirect effects are that we will see uh, major efforts to rethink the way that U.S. financial system is being regulated. We've had a, a, certainly a, a um, plethora of unsound financial products offered to American consumers and hopefully uh, the lesson we've learned is that consumer protection principles should not take second place. We want to make sure that people are not becoming over indebted or not paying too much for the loans that they're acquiring. But on a more positive note, we want to make sure that families who do acquire financial services understand what it is they're doing. The nonprofit sector alone is not large enough to serve everybody who needs access to financial services. So commercialization is critical, but commercialization it will not serve everybody who needs access to financial services. So I think it's critical that commercial banks and commercial NGOs that transform into commercial microfinancial institutions serve the clients that they're able to serve, but it then is crucial for us as donors and investors to understand who isn't served by those institutions. People need access to financial services to begin to move out of poverty, but it's not enough. You need to tailor your loan products. You need to understand your client needs, I think, in a much more profound way than many microfinance organizations do. And I think some poor clients may not actually um, need loans, they may need grants. And so I think it's be beginning to tailor sort of social safety net um, activities or products with microfinance products. And, and actually I think a, using a greater reliance on savings, working with clients first with savings products and not working first with, with loans. So we're beginning to, to embed the microfinance work that we support within a broader livelihoods development strategy and looking to see how we can combine microfinance services with other kinds of activities to help link people to markets. So that may be looking at value chain strategies to livelihood development strategies. So I think we are moving away from a strict orientation on only microfinance activities. Governments spend significant resources on social safety net programs that provide often cash transfers for very poor families. One of the criticisms of these programs is that once the, the, the subsidies ended, the families weren't necessarily any better off because they didn't build assets, they didn't build savings. So one of the things we're trying now in four or five Latin American countries is how to link uh, savings programs microfinance programs with the conditional cash transfer programs. If this catches on, and I know CGAP is interested in this as well, it has really the benefit of linking you know, a growing worldwide interest in these social safety net programs and microfinance programs. And I, to me, this is hopefully a wave of the future.